Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second day of the session with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation talking about poverty. We're really pleased to welcome uh, those who were able to attend yesterday, welcome you back. And if anybody uh, was not able to join us yesterday, then welcome to the second part of what certainly proved to be a really exciting and challenging and thought provoking session. We've got a lot to look forward to today, but before I outline what we're doing today, just a quick reminder of the housekeeping um, issues. Uh, your cameras and mics are off, so we can't see or hear you, but we do want to get your comments and uh, in the chat function, both as we go along and also in response to some specific questions. So, so please stay with us, don't go off and, and make lots of cups of tea. Um, and we also would like your questions throughout the morning. Uh, please use the Q&A function for questions, and then we'll pick them up in the question sessions that are on the programme. We really do want to hear from you. This is a great opportunity for you to pick the brains of the most experts in this field in the UK. So this is a, this is a really good chance. What we're going to do this morning is first of all, have a recap of what we learned yesterday. Um, please do listen to that. Um, it's a good reminder. And it's also a chance to bring to the whole, uh, all the attendees, any thoughts that you might have from, the, um, fr from, from yesterday or any thoughts and discussions you might have had um, at home or with colleagues. We're then going to hear from some groups in uh, around the UK, include, including groups in Scotland, about their experience of using framing in their day-to-day -day work. We're then going to be looking at how you can use the lessons from framing into practice and have some examples of how it matters and the sorts of metaphors that you can use in your everyday work. There's a couple of refreshment breaks because we're going right up till 12 o'clock. So don't feel you have to go without that coffee. Um, you, you will have a chance to, 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 to get it. But that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Luke, Luke Herion, who's Strategic Communications Manager, who's going to provide a recap on yesterday. Thanks. Thank you, Victoria. And good morning, everyone. Um, great to be here for uh, day two of our um, framing festival of sorts. So um, quick reminder on what we what we discussed. Framing, um, we understood, is about making deliberate choices about what we say, how we explain things, and crucially, what we leave unsaid. And we, we really explored that framing is a practice that can have a really powerful, um, can have powerful outcomes for how people think, how they feel, and how they respond and act. Um, and, and through Paul's session, we, we, we really looked at how as a movement, we're really kind of already shaping the national narrative in terms of our sector's collective communications, really trying to shift the terms of the debate with, with a lot of success in various areas. And in terms of our model, um, we, 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 oh, yeah, we learned that the dialogue kind of informs the discourse and the discourse informs the politics and the politics really informs the policy changes, which can in some instances lead to really big, powerful uh, impacts. Um, so a really swift recap, and you'll, you'll notice that over the course of our sessions, we've kind of hammering home these um, mental shortcuts. We understand that um, they're so important. These are kind of the big traditions of thinking that we all hold across society, some of which are contradictory. And the key to framing effectively is to avoid act activating these unhelpful uh, stories. So just very quickly, the concept that we're beyond poverty, there's no such thing as real poverty anymore that self-makingness one, that everyone can succeed if they try, just try hard enough and make the right choices. The idea of the culture of poverty that um, benefits claimants, uh, people pass their values onto their kids, it's not helping us. Um, and this fatalistic idea that the system is controlled by uh, elites and things aren't gonna change. 
and this limited understanding that poverty means going without the bare minimum and um, a narrow kind of understanding of um, uh, uh, deeper poverty. Um, and this sense of economic naturalism that our economy is shaped by forces beyond our control. Um, but there are some good um, mental shortcuts to tap into. We want to activate these ideas, the, the, the notion that um, when you, we do have some money, that does give us more options and, certain, and more freedoms. So we need to talk about options and opportunities. Um, and people in poverty do have fewer resources, and there's a sense that once you're there, it's actually quite easy to get stuck there, and it's harder to escape. Um, and uh, the notion that the government, this is a helpful, this is a helpful thought that kind of cuts through some of the fatalistic thinking. We know that the public does see a role for government to be there to take care of us and to protect us when we when we need it in terms of um, poverty. So. Um, just a big reminder of the shift from a sense of um, poverty being a personalised, individualised, um, a sign of personal failure to a more a systemic failure where we want to kind of design poverty out of, um, out of our systems, out of society. Um, so I think that stands as a bit of a refresher and a recap on um, on why on, on, on yesterday. Um, but essentially, we want to kind of expand the understanding of poverty and the poverty experience um, across our society um, so that it's a really collectivized and unignorable national concern with significance for all of us. So, on that thought, I will stop sharing my screen and I think I'm handing over to Camille to. Um, to kind of uh, chair our first session. Thanks, uh, thanks, Luke. Um, hello again, everyone. Um, just to let you know again, just a quick reminder that we are using the hashtag today talking about poverty. So anything that comes up from any of the sessions today or yesterday, please do get on Twitter and share. Um, your thoughts and reflections there. Um, and in today's panel session that's about to kick off, we'll be using the Q&A function as Victoria mentioned, rather than the chat function. So please do pop your questions in there because it'll be easier for me to monitor. Um, with us today, um, so put your cameras on. With us today, we are joined by Helen Barnard, Caroline Kennedy and Neil Cowan. Helen is the director of the Joseph Ra is Director of the Joseph Roundtree Foundation and a newly appointed Research and Policy Director at Pro Bono Economics. Helen has led analysis and policy work across a wide range of areas, including poverty and destitution, inequality, labour markets, housing and social security. Before joining us at JRF, she worked at BMRB Social Research and Opinion Leader Research. She's a social metrics commissioner, a poverty strategy commissioner, and a member of the West Yorkshire Economic Recovery Board and a framing guru. Caroline is a community activist with the Poverty Alliance in Glasgow. She uses her own experiences and those of other parents she campaigns with to reduce poverty for children and young people. Caroline is a former member of the Poverty and Inequality Commission, which advised the Scottish Government on child poverty issues, and a commissioner with the Poverty Truth Commission from 2014 to 2016. During this time, she was involved in their cost of, the, of school group and subsequent school clothing grants campaign, which I'm sure she can tell us more about, and she remains closely linked to the Poverty Truth Committee. Neil is the policy and campaigns manager for the Poverty Alliance in Scotland, which he joined in 2018, initially as policy and parliamentary officer. Prior to this, Neil has worked in policy and public affairs for charities, including the Hepatitis C Trust, the British Red Cross and the Refugee Council. Neil has an MA in politics and English literature and a master's in science in international politics from the University of Glasgow gosh, mouthfuls, all of these bios, but I hope I got all of them correct. Welcome to you all, and thanks for being part of today's panel um, session. I'd like to kick off the discussion by asking each of you to reflect on 
why framing the way we talk about poverty is important to you. And uh, Caroline, um, I might ask you to start us off if that's okay. Yeah, um, hello everybody, it's great to be here. It, framing has been a game changer for me. Yeah, I do a lot of blog writing, so how I write and how I tell my story. There, you know, it's not just, our, our stories are very powerful, they're very important, but framing gives it that extra, you know, it makes them stronger. It doesn't change your story, it doesn't change your message. Um, then, you know, and it's not about uh, one off isolated there, it could be dismissed. So it's about, it's about your story, but this is also happening to groups and communities that you're involved with. I was asked to, um, in 2017, to do a, a co-pilot um, for the, the framing workshops. So I, I was part of um, co-designing and co-delivering to other people who, with the experience of poverty like myself, who were doing their campaign work. Yeah, and you know, and it was great. It just, you know, I was at a stage when I was just learning about the framing, like a wee bit unsure, a bit apprehensive, but see when they get that there, you know, and how you look forward to going out there and using the framing in their own their own campaigns. So yeah, it's definitely been definitely been a game changer in, in how I communicate all my messages of it. Great. I mean, um, Neil, tell us tell us about your experiences of using framing. Yeah, sure. Hi there. Hi everyone. Um, and yeah, great to be to be with you all today. And thanks very much to, to GRF for inviting me to be part of the discussion. So just a bit of background on, on the Poverty Alliance through the National Anti-Poverty Network in Scotland. Um, and it's probably worth mentioning kind of at the outset why we decided to sort of so thoroughly integrate framing into and the principles of framing into, into all of our work, but particularly our policy and campaigns work. So I think very simply it's because of what we were doing and how we were communicating our messages just wasn't cutting through to the people we needed to cut through to, so particularly the public and uh, policy makers. And we were quite clearly given, you know, rising poverty rates and given the kind of damaging prevailing narrative around poverty, uh, losing the argument time and time again. Um, and losing the ability to, to kind of shape the narrative around poverty. And I think for us, what the work of the Framework Institute and what Framing offered us um, as, a, as the, the National Anti-Poverty Network in Scotland um, was the opportunity to kind of genuinely, meaningfully shift that narrative to enable change to happen, or at least to shift the dial a little bit on the possibilities for change. Um, so in terms of what we've practically done, there's been, there's been a lot. So I guess the overarching thing has been that um, in pretty much everything that we do from a, a policy and campaigns perspective, um, we try and implement now the, the framing principles and they've become absolutely vital to everything that we do. So whether that's in terms of our social media content, our media comment, our policy briefings, our research reports, um, with everything that we kind of put out into the world, um, we try and ensure that it utilizes the, the framing principles. Um, but also what we've been doing um, over the last few years, supported by uh, GRF, is to deliver framing training to civil society organisations, as well as people with experience of poverty, um, and as well, actually, some of the political parties across Scotland, um, with the intention being to really build that kind of common narrative that every organisation uh, working on poverty issues in Scotland shares. So really aiming to build that kind of critical mass so that we all speak with a united voice and then tell the same story. Um, I guess two very quick key lessons from us from that work has been one that it can be really challenging. So it does challenge the way that most of us have done policy work uh, or campaigns work. And, you know, telling a policy person that they should start with values rather than a stat can be pretty problematic or it can be pretty wounding for a, a comms person to essentially be told that the way they've been communicating key messages for years can actually risk being actively unhelpful. Um, but the second key lesson, I think, is that despite it being really challenging initially, often, um, it really, really, really works. And I think by giving... Um, it's given us a clear, consistent, well-framed narrative about the injustice of poverty. And I think with more and more organisations across Scotland embedding framing into the work, um, we've managed to have a real, real policy impact. Um, so it's been, it's been pretty transformative in terms of the way that we work. And I think we've seen real clear policy impact as well, um, which I'm sure we'll, we'll go into a lot in the, um, in the discussion. Um, and again, I guess even in the context of a session all about framing, um, I wouldn't kind of ascribe all of those policy impacts to framing, but it's clear to me that it's absolutely helps in terms of um, developing our shared narrative, galvanizing organizations and individuals behind that narrative um, and using that narrative to, to shift policymakers 
um, as we have done in the last few years. So um, yeah, it's been absolutely critical, critical to our work. Thanks, Neil. That's that's really um, interesting. Helen, I'm sure you can, um, hearing um, Neil speak there, you can resonate with a lot of what um, he was saying in terms of um, the difference it's made for JRF I want, and yourself. I wanted if you could talk to that. Yeah, so I mean, I think like Neil, my kind of enthusiasm for framing, it comes from years of frustration of, you know, both for myself and lots of other people kind of pouring time and energy into trying to create the best evidence we could, trying to come up with the right policies, you know, doing all of that, then managing to kind of get in the room with civil servants, say, who can make a difference or get onto the radio to make your case and then finding it all seemed to fall apart at that last moment. So I remember kind of doing a, a meeting with a bunch of civil servants. I would prepared a presentation. My colleagues had helped kind of get it right. I thought I'd given them a watertight case for why, in that case, social security was inadequate and it was causing hardship. And the solution was to increase the social security that people were getting. And we went through the thing and then I realized at the end, the message they had taken was people should get more budgeting advice and we need to increase our efforts to get people off social security and into work. So maybe we need harsher sanctions and conditionality. And that kind of just feeling that I had given one message and they had taken a completely different message. And suddenly on the radio, you kind of you've got maybe three minutes and it's one, you know, the only chance you've got to make your case on behalf of all these millions of people who are trapped in this situation. And then if, you know, wasting two and a half minutes basically arguing about whether it was real poverty or not and kind of feeling I'm not sure I did any good there. So I think it was that kind of that feeling that so much of the work we were doing wasn't actually reaching people in a form that would make the impact that we wanted it to. And I was very confused until I read the framing report. I didn't really understand why. And then I read it and thought, okay, now I get it. Actually, I understand how we're missing each other. So I think that's why I was so keen to start experimenting with it. And then I just found it worked, you know, just practically speaking, the interviews I did using the framing techniques just went better and I got the messages across. Um, and that sense that I had kind of done a reasonably good job at representing all the work of the campaigners and the policy and the evidence people. And I had done a reasonable job getting across the argument that millions of people need us to win. Uh, yeah. And a lot of that was just these techniques with kind of changing the communication of it. Yeah, that's um, that's uh, really valuable in terms of that, um, how you walked away from that interaction with the with key policy people, and it just didn't land the way you wanted. Uh, Caroline, have you had a, a, any sort of similar experiences using your own lived experience, uh, and and how framing has uh, has helped uh, you uh, to get the sorts of messages that you're talking about in your work in Scotland across to uh, people in power? Yes, I have. As Camille says at the beginning, I was involved in the school clothing bank campaign. This was with the Poverty Truth community, along with One Parent Family Scotland and Child Poverty Action Group. So what we learned um, through research was there was different levels of school clothing grant um, across all the local authorities, ranging from £20 to £110. So we were campaigning to get a, a minimum level right across Scotland. So um, throughout this campaign, we had a meeting with the then Secretary, um, Cabinet Secretary of Education, John Swinney. Right, so um, this is the example I actually use in the workshops is how not to do it, right? So this is obviously before the framing, before I get involved in reading about framing. Um, so there was myself and other parents. So we were all experiencing the same issues. We had, you know, different, you know, children at different age groups at different schools, but with the same issues, um, just that the, the cost of school wasn't affordable, particularly school clothing grants. At the time, my three boys were at secondary school. So there I am speaking to John Swinney, saying, you know, um, I get £47 and, you know, I'm £35 on compulsory blazer for each one. They have got to wear a full uniform. Um, this is costing me this, this cost me that, you know, and it was all about me, me, me all the time. Now, none of the, the other parents had said anything. 
And I didn't pick and bring the auntie saying, and so I was really talking about how this was affecting me. So then he said, no, listen, and then he says, um, he says, what school do you boys go to? I say, St Andrews. He goes, oh, I was only there yesterday. I still don't believe him, no to this day, right? And he says, oh, they look so smart in their full uniforms and their blazers. And I'm going, they do? I'd I actually gave him all that. I didn't realise till later on. I'd actually gave him all that information. So I did. So I allowed him just to kind of but to track off to what we were speaking about. And he said, oh, what a great school it was. Yeah, so um, get involved with the training and all that. I'm thinking, oh, I wish I could do this meeting again. But fast track to 2020, I never did a meeting with John Swinney. I had a meeting with the Minister of Transport, Michael Matheson. Is at the time, um, you know, I was in, when I was with the Poverty and Equality Commission, we were doing um, we were doing some work in transport, which wasn't affordable to a lot of people right across the board. So there was myself and two other commissioners. So I was to speak about um, apprenticeships, right? So my boy is in a four-year plumbing apprenticeship and he's he's going to pay like full bus fare, right? Now to and from his work. And part of this apprenticeship, um, he attends um, college and pays like, so that's the bus and the train there. Yeah. Um, so I was to, so I learned about not to, so I never mentioned about my son, I mentioned about all the apprenticeships across Scotland there. Yeah. So I wasn't make, I stopped it from being a one-off and about being my situation. You know, I would highlight about how they were, these apprenticeships were mostly in low-income families. And, you know, and some of them have got to travel by bus every day and some of that is all out of their communities. Then, you know, then Michael Matheson, you know, he says, you know, they get, see if they travel by train, um, they get well, a discount on the train with a young sports card. I'm going, you know, that is great, you know, it's great, it does that. But, you know, my issue here is the cost of the bus fares. So I was able to bring bring that back to get the questions answered that I wanted answered. I never allowed them to to derail me away away from it. So I was actually quite pleased about that meeting. Yeah, but I, I'm using um, framing. I, I use it all the time. I use it use it every day. You know, I've I've been doing the workshops on it, but this year we've been doing it online. Yeah, which has still been great because yeah. you know still had great feedback as as the same as we've had in venues. Yeah, but I, you know, and it's about changing people's perspective, changing their their attitudes. You know, when I had um, again, I was with the public Truth community. I was asked to do a, a talk, right? So in my talk, I always get in the framing, right? And I would always turn up with like, let's see the two kids. I'd turn up with them, them out. So part of the talk about my work with the, the poverty community, because that's why I get involved with the Joseph Brown Tree Foundation and the frameworks with, with, with through that through them. So um, I would I'd be speaking to them and I'd say the, about how social security is a public service. Yeah, it says it's there as an anchor for anyone who needs that. It. it says we, we shouldn't be, we're not ashamed when we phone up our doctor for an appointment and we're unwell, so why should we be ashamed to claim benefits when we need to? I'm saying the public service is NHS, um, the police education. So at the end of that talk, um, a few of them came up to me and says, we never thought about um, social security that way. So, you know, they say, we'll think about it that way now. So as you know, so, and you know, that is the power of, of framing. It just yeah. completely changes people's perspective. You know, it says it's no, it's, you know, it's just drowning out the narrative. It's the people who are living in poverty. It's their fault. It's not. It's you know, it's badly. You no know, designs have been been badly built. You know, so they can be rebuilt again. Yeah, and framing will make that message more stronger and more powerful. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. Caroline. Like. Um, You've been on such a journey with framing and um, 
it's something that you've grown in confidence um, uh, to be able to use in all of the meetings that you've done. And I just wondered if um, Neil and Helen, you know, could reflect on that and what the learning curve has been uh, for yourselves as professionals working in this space and, and uh, working with other colleagues in the sector, what, um, what you think the learning curve um, has been for the sector as well and, and how far we've come. So um, perhaps Helen, if you wanted to take that one first. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, something Neil said when he was first talking that changing how you communicate feels very unnatural there's a kind of, there's an emotional thing, which is to realise that the way you used to do it wasn't working. And I think particularly for all those of us who have kind of been in this game a long time, it's, it's never easy to realise that. And then actually it's, you know, it's kind of as if you're trying to learn to walk a different way. You have to, it doesn't feel natural to begin with, but if you do it enough times, it starts feeling natural. So, I mean, for me, I, I actually came across framing on a train to Wales a few years ago. We got the draft report in. And I was coming up to Wales to launch a report. And so I had all these media interviews. So I read it on the train and thought, yeah, this is really interesting. And my first interview of the day was with um, Julia Hartley Brewer, who is, some of you will know, is her style is quite combative. She's generally quite anti-poverty, generally. And I kind of went in with what was at that point my usual approach, which was, okay, what are the three statistics I want to get through, get over from this report? What are those three key facts I have to get in? And it was a complete disaster because we basically spent five minutes of her telling me it wasn't true and it wasn't real poverty and me asserting it was. And we got nowhere, you know, and it was horrible for me and I don't think it was very good. And so what I then did was to use the hour to my next interview to reread the Wales report and think, okay, let's try it differently. And so I thought, okay, it's not three stats, it's assert a value, which for me was quite weird because I'm a researcher and I'm used to dealing in facts, but assert a value get a metaphor in there and then come in with a kind of key stat. And I just found over the course of that day, even it was, it took me ages to get it right, but the interviews went better and better the more I was able to use that approach. And I didn't waste the time on air in these kind of arid debates over, but that's for, you know, it's not real poverty. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Goodbye. So I think it's, it definitely felt unnatural, but it was just, I immediately found it, the interviews less painful and more successful and therefore, you know, it felt better. Yeah. Neil? Yeah, I mean, I would yeah, echo um, everything that, that Helen said. I think initially, certainly um, it can feel unnatural. I mean, even thinking about, um, you know, the, using different kinds of metaphors um, and, you know, using the same metaphors again and again and talking about, you know, water all the time and grips all the time and walks all the time it's not the way that I naturally speak so it's a or write so it, it can feel strange initially and you kind of feel like, like everyone's gonna wonder why why I'm using the same metaphor all the time but actually um you know no one's paying as much attention to what you're saying as you are and actually the repetition is the really important part of it because it's about building that kind of critical mass and changing the narrative so yeah completely um, agree with everything that, that Helen said and similarly I suppose um you know I have a, a uh, a similar uh, tale from you, that you had to, to you usually like Julia Hartley Brewer um, story. So yeah, engaging with a Scottish Conservative politician, I went in with you know all, all these um, great plans for how I would sort of approach my argument or my my, uh, my conversation. Um, but I forgot all the key favorite principles in the moment. Um, I was political. I got quite riled up. Um, I threw stats at the MSP and um, forgot all the metaphors that work and really lost the argument. I had quite an unpleasant. Um, discussion with this um, this member of the Scottish Parliament um, and I suppose my key lesson from that is just to actually don't be an idiot like I was and forget all the principles in the moment uh, because it completely didn't work and it, it really um, exemplified to me the the real importance of all the very principles and, and um, yeah what can happen for me anyway when, when I didn't actually use them in the moment and um, I think following on from that we made a real concerted effort to, to really strictly adhere to favorite principles when engaging with um, with all parties. I think, you know, we saw some real success in that. So um, in terms of our engagement, for example, with the Scottish Conservatives, who are the, the official opposition in the Scottish Parliament, um, we used um, Challenge Poverty Week um, a couple of years ago to really focus on and trying to engage with the Scottish Conservatives. And we ended up getting um, Jackson Carlow, who was the leader of the Scottish Conservatives at the time, doing a little um, a video message using almost word for word our key messages, our really well-framed key messages. Um, because he saw no problem with, with with saying the kind of things that we kind of wanted them to say. Um, 
And does that video in itself mean anything? No, probably not. But we have just had a Scottish Conservative manifesto that committed to doubling the Scottish child payment, which is a benefit for low-income families um, in Scotland. And I can definitely see a clear correlation between the kind of different tenor and tone and framing of our engagement with the Scottish Conservatives <coughs> through things like that engagement and that, that video um, and their policy positions. So, for example, you know, throughout the pandemic, we were having almost uh, weekly, weekly meetings with uh, the Scottish Conservatives um, their key spokespeople and would that have happened a few years ago we were, when we were communicating in a much different way you know I, I don't think it would have so um i suppose it's definitely been a journey there's definitely been some some yeah lots of learning curves um but for me i can see a real policy impact and uh, through applying the agreement principles thanks neil and i think that that really resonated for me yesterday um what you were saying there about you know what's the impact and how do we measure it and it being a journey yesterday we um we heard from Luke when he was kind of explaining the, the principles around framing that um, the whole concept of this methodology is about shifting the whole house, that, um, that it's going to take a little while to get, um, to shift the entire conversation on poverty. And it's these incremental wins um, that we can see through um, manifestos or just tone and language and the way that the conversation can become opened up because of the use of these techniques um, that it's a marathon, not a sprint really in terms of uh, creating change in this area. I'm going to um, go to the chat box now and just to remind everyone that we have got the Q&A chat box and we've got about 15 or so more minutes with our um, expert lived and learned panel here with us today. So um, here's a question from Paula. Do you think that the new GB news channel is a threat to our messages or do you think this could be used to try to influence more people and get them on side? I'm not sure if I know what the GB news channel is, but um, if any of you do. <laughs> I'm happy to answer that very quickly because we have um, we've actually been approached by GB News to have a discussion about poverty, uh, and we had a conversation. So GB News is the is a new, um, yeah, I guess a new media outlet, opinion based, very much on a bit on the right of the spectrum. Um, that I think launched on Sunday. Um, I haven't I haven't watched it yet, but um, uh, yeah, we've been approached by them to to have a chat about about poverty, and we made the decision after having a discussion that actually, yeah, it's absolutely worth engaging with GB News. Um, they may well be a, a hugely influential. Um, media outlet on on the, the right of politics in the UK, uh, and therefore it'd be kind of negligent to to ignore um, what could be a really influential media outlet. I think um, very easy to to say no, I wouldn't engage with um, you know media outlets don't necessarily share your analysis of poverty. But the only way they will share your analysis of poverty is by engaging with them and trying to change the way that they view poverty and analyze poverty. So um, in terms of GB News, um, yeah, they could you know could be a threat, but only if you don't engage with with them. So that's that's our perspective on that. Yeah, and, and Helen, um, I wonder, um, you've had lots of interviews with people that haven't been particularly nice to campaigners or, or charities and um, perhaps GB News is of that ilk and, and if you've got any reflections on that. Yeah, so we, we, we've had the same conversation about, um, I think we were approached, it didn't happen, but we were approached. So I suppose, I, th I think there were a couple of things, I think one on GB News particularly, it's very early days. I don't think any of us know how it's going to work out, but it's worth. It. I think it's worth it. There are a really big range of journalists working on the GB News Channel, and you know there are some people who I would absolutely respect. I think they're fantastic journalists. There are other people who, having seen what they've put out, I find find it quite disturbing. But I don't think it's any different engaging with them to some of, say, talk radio, some of their shows, to some of the right wing papers, and so on. You know, it's it's speaking to a segment of our population, actually, and we need to get our messages across to the whole population. What I would say, though, is I think there is a duty of self care for people. Um, so we would all, so I would always, if our media team was saying we've got this, you know, invitation, we would always try and find out who else is going to be on, who is the interviewer, do we know anything about the approach they're likely to take, both so that say I could prep but also so we could judge, is this going to be a good environment for us? And I don't I mean, Caroline may have views on this. I think, I also think that where you've got people who are being put up because they're talking about their lived experience, I think that is a situation where you actually have to be more careful. So for somebody like me, I can go on, get taken apart, it'll be horrible, 
but I'm not ref I'm not having my own life challenged and questioned and undermined. Whereas I think that talking to people who are speaking from lived experience, and it's the same on some of the racial injustice interviews where people are being asked on as a black woman, for instance, to debate somebody who is just there and they don't have any skin in the game. They're not, it's not personal for them. And yet they're being asked to debate their existence almost. The emotional mm. toll that can take, I think you need to be really careful of. So one of the things in our, uh, I think in our guidelines about media is it is always okay to say no if you look at it and think emotionally, this is not going to be a good place for me. So I think it is looking at things case by case and deciding, is this a forum where we have a chance of getting our message is across? And is the person we're putting up kind of going to be emotionally all right with that? And I do think that is different when you're talking about personal experience than when you're talking about your learned experience. I don't think it's the same. I don't think it's the same thing. But I mean, Caroline may feel differently or may, I, I don't know how you, how she's experienced these things. Yeah, Caroline, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, um, definitely um, telling your own personal story is really hard. It's one of the most difficult things, you know, is um, a lot of my work, you know, been around child poverty because, when, you know, my boys are 20 and 22 now, but they were brought up in poverty there and um i and to speak about you know your experiences what you've had to do you had to go through it's it's really really hard it's really really difficult and any of the talks that i had given um it, it was always about the poverty truth community um they always had a worker there with me there so you always had that support and I had to support um, from them before and after. But when you're up there, you're on your own and it's your story. But um, I think now because my boys are older and they're away from that now, the both of them are working, they've got their own money and you know they have now got choices in their life that they never had when they were younger. I, th I think that for me, it's easier it's easier for me now there yeah, because I'm no in that situation is what I was years ago when I was, it was really, really, di really difficult. Um, but what you've um, got to remember is, you know, when that person after telling the stories, they go home and they're still loving it. Mm -hmm. You know, you could be talking in front of like a hundred people and kind of laying your life out there and and at the beginning, I, I felt like a failure. I really did. But see now, see when I, I can talk about it now, and I'm talking about it through the framing, that's made a difference. You know, just say, I've loved this, but you know, there, and there's still people loving that than now. So it's easier when, you know, when it's not just you, you know, even though your, your story is powerful and it's personal, but when you start to, to bring in, you know, your groups or, or your community, that way you don't feel as isolated or as alone with that. Yeah, and we're, we're going to touch on context framing um, a little bit later on in today's um, session. But I think that that's something that we, um, Caroline and, and um, the team at JRF in terms of our how we utilize framing with people with direct experience really on that third day of our training we really kind of bring in those elements about what parts of your story um, you know are for the public and what parts um, do you keep back um, don't we Caroline we kind of make sure that people kind of know the circles of uh, of the public and private that they um, can and should be sharing in a safe way and um, really good to partner also with other organisations that are media professionals in this space. I um, don't know if you wanted to comment on that Caroline or, or Neil in terms of your work in Scotland around that. Um, absolutely, She's, um, I mean because now that you know that I've been doing the framing for so, for so long you know and um, I do have a better understanding now of things of what, you know, because, you know, as I was saying at the beginning when, you know, I was asked to tell my story, I felt really kind of very isolated up there. But, 
you know, now I would change it and we, and we, and we do that for other people. We do make my wear. I'd, um, and I think that's when the, the training is great, especially, you know, that last part, that's a bit that I love anyway, is when, you know, they put everything in, in together, you know, and they think, you know, that they're working on their own stuff. But the the media, you know, and the interviews, I think is so essential. It's very essential for, you know, the training for them, you know, and it's just giving them, you know, really great advice about what to expect and about how they should, you know, how they don't have to say yes to everything. They don't have to tell that part of their story that they're not comfortable with. And that's, you know, and the, the, the media part of that is really essential. And it's very, it's about protecting, protecting yourself, you know, and it's protecting these, these people. Yeah, again, again just, yeah, I agree, agree with everything that, that Pearlie said. So one of the things that we've been doing um, as the Poverty Alliance, we started last year, um, is as well as delivering framing training to uh, civil society organisations and, and political parties. Um, we worked with a group of people with experience of poverty last year um, uh, to deliver media training, but with a particular focus on supporting them to engage in media and, and comms and campaigns work, um, utilising the framing principles. And I think that was really successful last year and um, we got a lot of um, yeah, really kind of impactful coverage, but I think really importantly, um, I think people felt supported. I think people um, can actually work so closely with them, were aware of what they, you know, what they, they could can share, shouldn't, shouldn't share, and all those kind of things about around boundaries. Um, so, so yeah, I think yeah, that's been that's been really impactful. I suppose one of the challenges with that has been, um, or one of the key kind of framing lessons that's been um, challenging in that kind of context was around toning down the politics because um, people absolutely rightly feel um, outraged by the injustice of poverty in this country, and they're absolutely right to do that. I feel angry most of the time, um, but ultimately that kind of anger and outrage doesn't of itself in and of itself change anything and it has to be kind of funneled and channeled um, in the most impactful way and for us um, framing is the most impactful um, way of doing that so um, yes yeah, because that's been, been one key lesson that, that kind of toning down the politics um, principle or, or, or lesson is can be a challenging one but it is a really really important one as well. Yeah um, thanks thanks for that Neil. I'll just return to some of the questions now that we've got in the chat box. So we've got one here from Mary. Um, it's a bit long so um, bear with me I'll read it out. How have you used framing to influence conversations with government? The Fairer Scotland duty sits alongside other statutory instruments, notably the Child Poverty Act, to commit public bodies to measurable targets, while the socioeconomic duty in Wales issues um, a vague commandment to consider opportunities to address socioeconomic disadvantage with scant commitment to even explain or own the roots of that disadvantage. To what extent do you think framing, which seems to have been used well in Scotland for longer um, in than in Wales, has contributed to this difference? So maybe that's one for you, Neil, um, and perhaps Caroline. Um, and I don't know what, to what extent it's contributed to the difference. I suppose what I would say is that I can definitely see um, a clear link between the, the the work that's been done in framing in Scotland and policy impact. Now, clearly, the kind of policy impact we've had in Scotland over the last few years around poverty isn't all down to framing. And I think the lines between correlation and causation can sometimes be a little bit blurred in, with, with this stuff. But I think there can be no doubt that certainly in Scotland, we have seen some big policy advances um, in recent years. And I really do think that efforts to, to shift the narrative and to implement framing principles has been really, really important in that, particularly um, in terms of building cross-party support and taking the sort of the party politics not entirely out of it because that's impossible, but certainly, um, yeah, just building that cross-party support. So just for, you know, for example, we have in Scotland now um, a Child Poverty Act setting quite ambitious child poverty reduction targets, um, which was supported by every MSP from every single party in the Scottish Parliament. And that's really significant for us. Um, we also have a new Scottish child payment um, of £10 per week per child, which is a benefit for low-income families, again, supported by every party, in which actually um, at the elections in May, every party committed to at least doubling. Again, that's really, really significant. Um, and then, you know, we also had three out of five part main parties um, committing to uh, establishing a minimum income guarantee in Scotland with a cross-party group, again cross-party, um, being established to develop it. So I think um, 
for me anyway, um, you know, I wouldn't say that framing is, a, is the absolute silver bullet that has achieved all that, but for me, there's no doubt that it's contributed massively um, to those kind of policy advances, particularly to making sure that there's cross-party support for those policies, and which is obviously absolutely vital in terms of yeah, and making sure that, that kind of change is, is long-lasting. Um, mm. Not sure if that answers the question, but I hope it does at least somewhat. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, Helen, I don't know if you had any reflections about um, the policy landscape um, in Westminster and, and um, moving in a more positive direction and, and the value of framing as part of that in conversations with um, number 10 or, um, or behind, behind closed doors with, uh, with different departments. Yeah, so I think, uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's right. Um, so obviously one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing is trying to talk to people who are not uh, natural allies on poverty, particularly people on the right of centre. Um, so kind of doing things like private round tables and so on. And I've definitely found that if I'm kind of speaking or chairing or talking to people, using some of the framing techniques, it's as if, you know, the kind of the conversation is going along certain channels and you need to switch it to a different channel of conversation to actually get to the discussion of the solutions. And framing helps you do that. You kind of sidestep some of those bear traps. Um, I think it also means actually that we can be a lot more confident engaging in these conversations. So you can stop being scared of what are you gonna say if you get some of the kind of most common anti-poverty arguments kind of thrown at you in terms of it's all about behavior and choice and people will just spend the money on the wrong things and you know these kinds of things. I think going into that conversation knowing that you have quite often practiced what it is you can say, which will let you kind of engage with somebody and move on to a better place. I think it helps to, it helps you, it helps us to be a bit more relaxed about it. And that helps what Neil was saying about it not feeling like a combative conversation, it feeling like a genuine discussion rather than an argument that's gonna just kind of eventually run into the sand. Great. We've got another question in the chat. Yesterday, um, this one's from Vivian. We talked about how um, images, certain images can trigger mental shortcuts, um, helpful and help, helpful and unhelpful. Um, and we saw some typical images that the media use to illustrate poverty. Um, how have the panelists changed the images that they use now? So in your work, um, can you talk about the power of images in at JRF or at, at, um, at Poverty Alliance and in Caroline, maybe your perspective um, as someone with direct experience on the power of images? Um, yeah, well, when this is, I, I do a lot of writing. I, I write blogs. I actually enjoy writing. I think it's very therapeutic. But anyway, um, you, know, you know, part of the training, you know, it's about the metaphors. And the metaphor is creating a mental image in, in the head. Um, so, you know, that's what I do when, when you know, when I'm writing, I'll put in the, the metaphors, um, you know, and it's sticking to the same metaphor through, throughout, like, your, your currents, whatever. So I, I think, you know, um, I think they're, they're actually really useful you know, when, when you're using that and you are creating that image for a person there. Mm. There, like say, if you're saying like um, anchor, you know, and then you right away, you know, can I have this in their head, I, um, I, th I think it's been very useful in what I've written. It certainly helped me to create a clearer picture, a clearer story from what I, the message that I am, you know, trying to put out there, the story that I am telling, and it certainly um, helped with that anyway. That's great. And, and Neil and Helen, on, um, on making sure that we don't undo all of that powerful work that we're doing in our written comms through, through images, I don't know if you had any reflections on that. Yeah, and, and, I mean, in terms of visual images, I mean, this is obviously this is a recurring issue in, in terms of media um, depictions of poverty. I mean, in the Scottish media, there's always two images that, that are always used. So there's one where it's a, there's a little boy kicking a football outside a, a sort of dilapidated, boarded up tenement in Glasgow. And that tenement hasn't existed for about a decade. It was knocked down about 10 years ago, but yet still we see that image 
use time and time again as if that as if a boarded up tenement building in some way depicts poverty in Scotland in 2021. Um, there's another one was a there's a, a little girl who's looking um sort of forlornly out the window. Um, but they're they're not they're not realistic depictions of poverty in Scotland in 2021. I think there is a risk that even if you know the 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 text is is well framed, etc., that those images kind of undo that. So what we used to do um was call out media outlets that, that used what we would deem to be stigmatized images. And um, we realized that actually that wasn't particularly helpful because ultimately that image has just been used because it's probably a really tired, stressed sub-editor that's just, you know, trying to do a million things at once and using that image because that's the image that they've always used for poverty uh, stories. Um, so what we've been trying to do now is, is engage more um, privately and sort of discreetly with, with media outlets to try and encourage them to use more realistic depictions of poverty in, in Scotland in 2021, which, you know, is essentially maybe just like um, someone at their table stressed about the bills they've received or, you know, something like that. Um, so, so yeah, I think the, the sort of visual images um, discussion is a really, really important one um, because I think there is a risk that those kind of uh, sort of stigmatising or, or unhelpful images of poverty can kind of undo a lot of the good work that, that um, that framing can, can achieve. Um, but yeah, it's certainly something that we, we are trying to address, but it's, it's a challenge because, you know, as I say, sub-editors are the ones that generally use these images are um, pretty tired of stress, I think, a lot of the time. So, um, so yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, and Helen, any reflections on, you know, how we've kind of taken that on board at JRF? Yeah, we've, I mean, we've definitely changed wholesale, I think, the images that we use. Um, and again, like Neil, we, uh, like Neil, we've had our, media team and some of our content team talking behind the scenes with journalists and outlets where we've seen them use an image which we know is unhelpful um, either because it's stereotyping or because we think it might trigger one of the cultural models we're avoiding like kind of pictures that look very a kind of black and white historical type looking pictures you know we know that that may trigger the kind of poverty is only in the past type view um, but also trying to have pictures that people will connect with you know one of the big kind of underlying things about framing is it's about we and it's about all of us and it's about it, kind of helping people feel connected to the real life experience of people who are just like them but are trapped in poverty and actually finding image that will help that connection is really important whereas if you have you know child on their own looking miserable outside a boarded up shop that immediately is going to trigger all sorts of the kind of it's the parents fault why aren't they in school you know, there's all sorts of things you can just see it triggering. Um, so I think that it, it is a really important thing that we've looked at. Yeah, and uh, just to let everyone know that we do have a reporting um, poverty guide on our website, which um, you might find useful um, as part of our talking about poverty resources. So I'd encourage you to check that out. We've got time for one last question before we have to wrap up. So um, it's for the whole panel. Could you share any top tips for opening discussions using the framing approach. So what are your top tips for framing and opening discussions? Neil, I'll start with you. <laughs> to be honest, I would just say um, doing exactly what the GRF Framing Toolkit tells you to do. So um, leading with values, um, which again is, you know, as a policy person, um, it's initially challenging to get your head around that, that you're not just going to lead with a big bombastic stat that you're really proud of or like a big you know key piece of research that you're you're, you're just put in there but actually even with the values um getting people on board uh from the absolute outset of any discussion with values of justice with values of compassion that we all share um for me that's been been the most impactful um so yeah that'd be my top tip um and also um yeah just to, to read the jrf premium toolkit because it's absolutely my my bible a lot of the time um, so yeah, that'd be what I would say. Caroline, yourself, what's your top tip? Yeah, um, I totally agree with Neil there, um, leading with values, you know, because when you start that with the value, it's just tapping into their value, it's just reminding them that they care there and they want to keep listening or they want to keep reading, whatever it is. So I um starting off with that um that that value is always a good starting point. Just get it in as early as you can. Great. You guys are both great for my upcoming session on values, which will follow after the refreshment break. So thanks for that. Um Helen, what top tip from you or a couple of top tips? Um, so I think uh, one is to think about what might be the opening question you might get and actually rehearse, ideally out loud, either on your own 
or with a friend or a colleague. So practice saying the things out loud you might want to say. I just find it makes so much difference. And I think being able to have the confidence to weave these things in. So, you know, if the opening question is, well, what does your report tell us today? It's still fine to say, well, I think we all want to live in a society where everybody can have a good start in life and can afford the essentials. But our report shows that too many people are caught up in poverty. And so you can use it as almost the your lead in to your answer. Don't feel pressured by the interviewer to jump in with, well, it says 14 million people live in poverty because that is the direct answer. And I think similarly, you know, if kind of, I've had questions where the interviewer wants you to pick a fight and it's not a helpful fight. So your report says poverty's on the rise. Isn't that because this government simply doesn't care and is cutting benefits, for instance? That is an invitation for you. And sometimes it will be, you might agree with them. Sometimes you might not, but you don't have to engage with that. You can still do the, well, I think, everyone in this country, regardless of their politics, would want everyone to have da 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 da. Our report says that's not happening and we need government business. Da, da. So you can kind of have the confidence not to go where the interviewer wants you to go, but to stick to how you want to introduce what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. That um, that uh, pivoting to what uh, to what you want to get onto is something that uh, we've heard um, also from Caroline today. Um, thank you so much to our panel. I'm really afraid that that's all we've got time for today. Um, we haven't got to all the questions, but don't be disheartened. Um, if you've got a burning question that couldn't be answered by our panelists, we do have another Q&A session um, with the people who've been presenting the workshops today um, at 11.40. So you might be able to get your question in then. Um, thanks again for everyone who engaged in this session. We're now gonna go straight into a five minute break and when we return, Luke will be leading the next se segment about framing poverty in practice. So thanks again to our panelists, Helen, Neil, and Caroline. No. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank, you. Thank you. Hello, so welcome back everyone. Um, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you so much to our fab panelists. Um, I think we've all kind of, uh, the pennies dropped that framing is a, a practice and it's something that um, does represent a significant change in how we communicate and how we uh, choose to explain uh, the issues that we want to put forward. Um, uh, but we, we really would kind of urge you um, to consider it as something to try out and to um, experiment with and not to consider as um, uh, an intimidating thing that has to be perfect, but just to kind of give it a go. And um, this this moment in our event kind of represents a bit of a, a pivot. Um, we've, we've had a, a brilliant look at a lot of the, the context of framing, the power of framing and the potential of framing. And indeed uh, had a fab session uh, concluding yesterday from Paul about um, what not to do. So you might be pleased to um, learn that this afternoon, uh, this, the, the next uh, three sessions are really focusing on um, what to do and how to frame. And we hope that this will become a, a bit of a primer in the framing tools, um, tips and techniques. And um, so in terms of the next three sessions, as you can see, Camille's going to kick us off with a bit of a deeper dive in the power of um, using those tried and tested values of compassion and justice and the power of that. And I was thrilled that Neil kind of uh, put that forward as his top tip to kind of start the, start the conversation that we want to have with people to kind of lay the grounds for the conversation. And then Paul's going to um, zoom in on uh, the, met the metaphors um, and a brilliant way of kind of uh, telling the stories that we need to tell. Um, and then I'm gonna come back with a bit more um, on sequence and how to compose a, uh, we talked a little bit about the order, but look uh, just a, a brief look at structure and how we would order our ideas to, for, um, to have kind of a compelling argument. And then I'm gonna just present um, a bit more on framing for understanding and we're going to do a little bit of analysis in the round to look at how to improve a few passages so that they're 
really well framed um, for, for contextual understanding. So um, yeah, um, let's get stuck into some framing practice. So Camille, can I hand over to you for the next session? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Luke. Um, so framing with values to show why poverty matters. As we heard from our um, panel, values are a critical part of framing. They are the first and most important tool in opening up hearts and minds. So what follows is how you can use values to demonstrate why poverty matters. So when we lead with values, we tap into deep beliefs that guide our thinking and behavior. Values establish why an issue matters. They guide our thinking, creating a space for a different type of conversation. And they create a shared grounds for action. They make issues collective and shared, and they help people to see how an issue matters for all of us, not just other people. They also establish a powerful, unarguable truth. The right values frame activated in the right way is really hard to disagree with. Research has shown that without a value at the start of our communication, people struggle to see the point of engaging with an issue and they're left to their own devices uh, when it comes to understanding why an issue matters. As well as providing a single motivating point for entry, uh, motivating entry point for an issue, they also pr provide people with the goals around which they organize their beliefs. In this way, values serve as a fundamental organizing principle that people um, use to evaluate social issues and reach dec decisions. So frameworks, as I mentioned yesterday, frameworks defines an effective values frame as one that is sticky. It's easily communicable and it, that helps people reach productive understandings on the decisions um, or the questions and issues that um, are facing our society today. And we can see this playing out in real life in important ways. So take Brexit, an issue that was and is about lots of different things, our economy, our laws, our trade, our travel, to name but a few. But the Leave campaign boiled down to be about one thing. Can you take five seconds to pop in the chat what you think that uh, one thing is or was? Yeah, I can see some comments coming through. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a few comments coming in there about take back control. So some people might have thought about freedom or sovereignty, um, immigration. Um, it, it was ultimately about the people of the UK being able to choose for ourselves. And this was values framing in action and it worked. So I'm sure you can think of other examples of campaigns or issues being framed with strong values um, that, that guide um, that issue. My favorite example of a values frame in action in recent years um, has been the abo uh, campaign for uh, abortion law reform in Ireland in 2018. Take a look at this advert and see how they've set up values as the entry point to the topic. Pride. It's something that we are really good at. Coming together for the moments that make this country great. Grand Slams and Riverdance, Italia 90 and yes, equality. But what about the moments of shame? Those we're not so good at. Generations of letting down women and girls. Second class citizens and double standards burying our heads as they booked their flights. An Irish solution to an Irish problem. No more. On May 25th, we come together for our wives, girlfriends, sisters, 
friends, daughters and granddaughters. Together, let's finally do better. Together, let's be caring and compassionate. Together, let's be proud to live in a progressive Ireland. Together, let's vote yes. So, this campaign is about pride in one's country and what makes people proud. And it's been countered with shame um, in the oppositional messaging there in the in the in the ad. Um, and then it brings in values of compassion towards the, the end. And throughout it, it talks about together. It collectivizes an issue and it taps into deep beliefs about what Ireland can be proud of, whilst identifying for the viewer that, that they might know someone for whom this issue affects. It avoids completely the old messaging of making abortion safe, free and legal. And it positions the issue as firmly something that a proud and progressive and compassionate Ireland should do. Ultimately, this campaign was successful in achieving um, legislative reform on abortion. Um, so it, it um, is an example of a, a winning campaign. So what works when we talk about poverty? Um, what are the values that work there? Uh, as I mentioned, frameworks tested a range of values as part of the work we commissioned. Um, some of the values included compassion, equal opportunity, interdependence, freedom, economic prosperity, justice, and a strong economy. The values frame that came out on top was the frame of compassion and justice. And here's an example of that in action. In our society, we believe in showing compassion towards others and protecting each other from harm. Yet right now, many in, live in poverty. We share a moral and social responsibility to ensure that everyone in our country has a decent standard of living. This values frame helps people to see that poverty exists, to uh, believe that ending po poverty is a shared moral imperative, and to build support for policy solutions. You can use this frame by activating shared values of compassion and justice, bringing these ideas to life and avoiding talking about fairness. The values frame of compassion and justice together has been tested to work across the political spectrum. So it's really important that we talk about compassion and justice. Compassion alone only worked for left leaning voters. Now, I need to say here that you don't have to use these exact words. The idea, it's the ideas that matter. And the key components of the idea are reminding people that we live in a compassionate and just society, connecting that society to a decent standing standard of living and reminding people of our social and moral responsibility to protect people who are not doing well. The key things that this value isn't doing is talking about fairness, um, but you can express this value in many different ways. And I'll come back to that fairness point on the next slide. So on the screen now, there are lots of different examples of the ways you can use compassion and justice. The great thing about values frames is that you can use them fl flexibly. If you want to be um, relaxed, you can say, we believe in doing the right thing. If you want to be a bit more forceful, um, you can make a bit of a stronger point. You can say, we need to put this issue right. If you want to make the most strident of arguments, you can say it's not on or it's out of order. The thing to point out here is that when we talk about something um, being a problem, we talk about it being not right rather than being not fair. And this is something that uh, we started to chat about a little bit about yesterday and, and Paul mentioned in his um, presentations yesterday. The, the fairness um, value 
is unhelpful and fairness is an unhelpful word. It creates a dynamic between you and the person, group or audience that you're communicating with that the unfairly treated group must justify why they should be fairly treated. It focuses on the individual rather than the system that needs to change. And if a problem is identified as unfair, then fixing the problem likely requires a complete overhaul, which could be unattainable. So it creates that fatalistic thinking and um, that, prob that problems are impossible to solve and even incremental wins may not seem sufficient. The other thing to point out on this spectrum is the use of as a society. And, and Helen picked up on that as part of one of her tips about collectivizing the issue. You can see examples across the spectrum here about uh, as a society and um, language that is co co collectivizing the issue. Um, and it's really, once we collectivize an issue, it, it's really hard to, to rebut and to disagree with. So back to one of our star framers that we touched on yesterday, uh, Marcus Rashford. So here in this tweet, he's using the values frame of justice and compassion to talk about free school meals. This was never about you or me. This was never about politics. This was a cry out for help from vulnerable parents all over the country. And I simply provided a platform for their voices to be heard. I stand proud today knowing that we have listened and we have done what is right. There is still a long way to go, but I am thankful to you all that we have given these families just one less thing to worry about tonight. The well-being of our children should always be a priority. So here he's talking about we have done what is right. Great, strong values framing there. But you can see through his use of we and uh, we have done what is right, that he's collecting it. He's not collectivizing it. He's not making it about himself as a spokesperson. He's making it, it about us as a society and what we should do, um, what is our moral responsibility. So Helen kind of touched on, on this conversation that I'm about to share with you. Um, it's another example of values doing a lot of work in a different conversation. So Julia Hartley Brewer, not known for being friendly to campaigners and charities and activists, um, but I'm gonna play about a minute or so of this uh, interview and uh, hopefully you can see where values come in companies who are working for incredibly high level posts you can be well, we're not yeah but we're not talking about those people we're talking about people who, who, are, who are scratching by to make ends meet and and putting food on the table and a lot of that comes down to as, as lots of people listening right now to talk radio will know actually the hours that you work if you're on a low income uh, you're getting low paid you it's, it's all it's all in the hours and the more hours you do the more money you, you come in and people who are, people who are working part-time and if they can't get full-time work that's an issue but if they're working part-time and can't make ends meet there is a simple solution to that isn't it working part working full-time well it's worth noting that poverty rates for people like houses where you've got everyone in work are also going up ah no but no but no, those that. statistics aren't for people working full-time i've looked into those statistics in great detail they're for people who are working between them as a couple three days a week uh, most couples work 10 That's days a week true. between them yes it is true i've looked into the figures i've, I've actually double checked it with the work and pensions for, department when you look at the poverty rates for, for, for parts of lone parents working full-time in the uk those are going up. So those are people who are working all that we would, anybody would expect. And to be honest, I think that as a society, we, we believe that everybody should be able to reach a decent standard Absolutely. of living. And when, and when you have over a quarter of a million disabled people in poverty in Wales, yeah. many of whom are in work, I think we know that's not right. There no, is I'm, something wrong with our No, I, listen, I think everybody... People in that. I, I, I absolutely... If you, do, if you do a full day's work and you work a full week, you should be able to have a decent standard of living. Absolutely. I think everyone would agree with you on that. And, and, and absolutely, people who are disabled absolutely should... Absolutely absolutely make sure they are, are living a decent standard of living, no question at all. But that's not the vast... Oh, sorry about that. So um, did you hear um, in that conversation, as a society, Helen bringing that, as a society, and a decent standard of living, and we know that's not right. And did you hear um, at one point, uh, Julia, agreeing with... Uh, 
Helen on, uh, absolutely, she said. So the compassion and justice values frame is one that takes us away from arguing and reacting, and it moves us towards agreement. In this instance, it acted as a circuit breaker in the interview, creating the space for a different conversation and allowing for uh, a shared grounds for potential action on issues. Can you see the values frames working in these two pieces? So um, it's morally wrong. So what it says here is Margaret Greenwood, Labor Shadow Work Compension Secretary said, these figures are truly shocking. The two child limit is an attack on low income families, quite strident there. It is morally wrong and it risks pushing people into poverty. So some metaphor framing there as well, which uh, we'll get, Paul will get us onto a little bit later. It cannot be right that the government is making children the target of austerity, treating one child as if they matter less than another. Labor will make tackling child poverty the priority it should be. And this was something that we touched yesterday, an example from the Bishop of Durham, a combination of low pay, unstable jobs and high housing and living costs are locking families in a daily struggle to put food on the table. So some good metaphors there, but it's simply not right. That strong values frame that some children get support and others don't. We share a moral responsibility. So collectivizing it and talking about a moral responsibility to make sure that everyone in our country has a decent standard of living and the same chances in life, no matter who they are or where they come from. The government has an opportunity to right this wrong, justice and compassion there, by removing its two child limit policy. We urge the Prime Minister to address this burning injustice. So you can see different levels in this second one about um, different levels of uh, flexing that justice and um, compassion values frame. Yesterday, Paul um, mentioned that the Archbishop of Canterbury is, uh, has been one of our great allies and messengers. And um, he set up a housing commission and on their website, you can see the values. He didn't just stop when he was doing his YouTube clip and doing his public speaking. He made sure that um, those values frames were peppered throughout um, any written material. So on the website here, it's just not right that more than 8 million of us in the UK live in unaffordable, insecure or unsuitable homes. Whole sections of our society, including people of all ages, are affected by the housing crisis, but those caught in poverty who are, but it's those caught in poverty who are bearing the brunt of this injustice. So quite strong values framed there. I just wanted to end by showing you another example of values at work using a different values frame altogether. So this isn't a values frame that um, should be used for poverty, but it is a values frame about the value of human potential. So the values frame says strengthening the systems that provide education, healthcare, support for families, helps us care for our greatest assets, our people. Investing in the potential of children is essential in building a country. So I'm going to show you what this looks like in practice. This is Zoe. She's won. And she's running for president. Because if she's cared for, kept safe, and has a chance to learn and grow, then she could lead our great nation in, like, 50 years. Help kids like Zoe dream big. The why. For early learning, child care, mentorship, and more. For a better us. So I'd welcome your reflections in the chat there um, briefly, um, if you've got any reflections on that video, and I'll, I'll go back to what the values frame says itself.
I can't see anything coming through in the chat, but I suppose what I wanted to point out here and the challenge to, um, to you all as now framers in Wales is that that video didn't actually use any of the language that's written on the screen here. It picked up on the idea and made, um, made that value of human co co potential come to life. And I think that is the challenge for us as um, policy people and communicators in the poverty space. This is the next level framing that we need to get to when we're talking about poverty. Uh, so gauntlet thrown down, colleagues in Wales, um, this, is the, this is the talking about poverty goals uh, to get to this level of framing. If I can just leave you with um, some practical tips when we're framing with values uh, to get us started on that journey. So we often think that our communications are infused with our values, but they need to be explicit. As you begin uh, to use this approach um, and apply it to your work, uh, I want you to remember these four key things. So strong values frames should be used early uh, in a piece of content and referred back to. They should collectivize and be used with we, us, our. They should be reinforced or illustrated with images um, that don't uh, trigger or stigmatize. And they shouldn't be crowded out with other values frames. So with that in mind, I'll hand over now to Paul, who is going to take us through the other important tool of metaphors. Hi everybody, sorry about that small delay. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, metaphors then, um, along with values that uh, Camille's just been talking you through, this is kind of like a dynamic duo of uh, communication tools for us. Um, and something that I've uh, personally worked with an awful lot over the last few years. Uh, so as we know from yesterday's sessions, um, there are stories that people have in their heads that uh, make it harder for them to understand poverty. Um, and what metaphors do is they help to build understanding. We all use them all the time, uh, often without even thinking about it. So I was thinking about what are my favourite metaphors, and one of my favourites is to describe something that's gone wrong in a messy way as a dog's dinner. Uh, so obviously it's not literally a dog's dinner, but hopefully there I've, I've painted a picture that you can understand and relate to. Um, other metaphors you might frequently hear, but not even a clock really, are things like a heart of stone, uh, light of my life, or even... He's got ants in his pants. And again, those are metaphors and not literal. So why metaphors? Well, um, as a writer, I love using metaphors. The right ones are a really powerful way uh, to help people understand something, using an idea that's familiar to them and that they, they understand and can relate to. They provide a strong mental image. They help people to sort of visualize and imagine something. They can also make an abstract or difficult concept much more straightforward and concrete. And they can explain why something happens rather than it being something that comes across as being just normal or natural or just how something is. So some practical tips for using metaphors. We know that most people don't really understand poverty or how it works. So with a strong explanatory metaphor, um, we have some tips. Use the metaphor early uh, before you bring in the details or the data because you want to start painting that picture right from the start. Use it to explain how an issue or a process or a problem works to show how something doesn't just happen. You can extend the metaphor uh, with the choice of images, or you can bring in related ideas. But be careful not to crowd out your metaphor with other metaphors, or muddle it up with other ones. A good metaphor helps someone imagine what something is like, but if you're trying to get them to imagine 
more than one thing at a time, it just gets messy, like a dog's dinner of metaphors, if you like. So frameworks, uh, as with the, the values that Camille was just talking you through, they tried out a lot of different metaphors to find out which worked best in shifting people's understanding. And the two that worked best were these, restricts and restrains, which is really helpful for talking about the experience of being in poverty, and currents, specifically currents of water, for the experience of um, moving into or out of poverty. So these, um, these two bits of text here are just a couple of examples of how you can use these metaphors, but um, as Camille said about the values, you can be flexible with these as long as you get the right idea across. So um, with restricts and restraints, you can talk about trapped, locked in, caught in the grip of poverty, things like that. With currents, you can talk about forces like push and pull. You can talk about people being swept into poverty. Um, so there's, there's various ways you can describe these. They don't have to be totally prescriptive, but they do get the idea across. So I'll just read these out to you. Uh, on restricts and restraints, uh, our economy is locking people in poverty. Low paid, unstable jobs mean more and more families can't put food on the table. With the economy driving up the cost of living, many are caught in a daily struggle to make ends meet, unable to think about a different future. And I'll be going into both of these uh, a bit more in a moment. Uh, and on currents, Low wages and rising living costs create currents that can pull people into poverty. And sometimes things happen that threaten to pull us under, like losing a job, coping with a disability, or leaving our home to get out of an abusive relationship. We need a benefit system that anchors people so they don't get pulled into the current of poverty. So uh, we'll start with uh, a bit more on currents. Uh, and this uh, doodle that I did a couple of years ago is uh, one way we can show how this works. So you can see that there are circumstances that create currents. Um, things like losing a job, a relationship breakup can pull people into poverty. But what we can also do with these metaphors is bring in the solutions using the same metaphor. So here we're talking about how the uh, social security system could help people stay afloat when they're struggling. And uh, crucially, what we have in the image there is a person with their own boat and their own paddles um, <clears throat> because it's been made possible for them to, um, to make some progress. The, um, the other thing I would just say here when, um, when talking about currents or using uh, either of these metaphors really, is to really think through how visually that metaphor works. Um, you can end up if you're if you think oh an anchor yeah that's that's a good uh, metaphor for how the social security system could be, but then if you want to talk about it keeping people afloat, if you think through that 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 image that doesn't really work because the anchor is a weight that holds something down. It's not going to keep someone afloat. So it just takes a little bit of care to think about how these things actually work, and I I do think through them very visually when I'm using them. In our talking about poverty and coronavirus toolkit uh, that we um, published last year, there was, um, there was some work we did with frameworks again um, on the current metaphor and bringing in a sort of idea of a storm because that, that is a sort of extreme version of currents, if you like. Um, and there was one expression um, of this that people really got and responded to. And that was the idea that we were all in the same storm but not all in the same boat <clears throat> because people were um, we're talking oh we're all in the same boat but actually we know that for people already having a hard time the impact of, of covid has has brought new challenges on top of the ones they were already facing uh, i did talk you through this um quickly yesterday it's our, our keep the lifeline campaign but i think it's useful just to pause a moment and have a look at how we've used metaphors in that campaign um, so just a reminder that the, uh, the Keep the Lifeline campaign um, is our, uh, our campaign for the government to keep the £20 uplift to universal credit uh, that it introduced during the pandemic, or at the start of the pandemic, I should say, um, and to extend that to people who are on legacy benefits, um, those benefits that haven't 
they haven't yet come across into universal credit. The, um, so where you can see the metaphor coming across strongly here, tying in with that COVID storm idea, we've described the, uh, the solution, the, um, the uplift as a lifeline uh, to show how essential it is. And we also use it to talk about keeping families afloat. So you can see we've extended that metaphor there. It's showing what the solution is and it's showing the impact of that action, what that does for people. And we can also use it to talk about what it'll be like if that lifeline's taken away. Um, and we'll be doing more work on that uh, on the next stage of the campaign. These messages also show how we can use metaphors alongside our other framing tools to make a strong case. So you recognize in here uh, the compassion and justice value that um, Camille was just talking about, um, and to show that there is a solution and that change is possible because we want to get around that fatalistic thinking. And here we can see how effective the right metaphors can be because we see them repeated back to us in headlines um, or in speeches by politicians. This was a headline from the BBC homepage uh, in January and you can see the word lifeline in there, which is exactly how we would want them to describe it. And then moving on to our second tried and tested metaphor, uh, this is restricts and restrains. And here's a, another doodle we've used a lot to explain how this works. So you can see here how um, this person is locked in poverty um, because of a combination of different factors. And it's really helpful to use this to get away from that self-makingness um, shortcut that people have, that um, people are able to just turn things around by themselves by working more hours, working harder, um, all those kind of things. So here you have a person who is in a low paid or insecure job. Um, their housing costs are high and eating up a lot of their income. Um, benefits have been frozen, so there's nothing coming in um, to sort of help out with that low paid um, wage. And then the cost of living generally has gone up and all these things are kind of conspiring against this person. But again, importantly, um, these little lever mechanisms on the, the side of the doodle there show that if, um, if solutions are put in place for each of these problems, then there is a way of unlocking someone from poverty and, and freeing them from that trap. And this is a very sort of simple expression um, of um, the solutions to unlocking people from poverty. So uh, very simply showing benefits as a key that can help unlock poverty's constraints. And there are other ways of doing this as well. Here you can see um, some of the different ways that this metaphor is being expressed in headlines and in tweets. So we have trapped in poverty there at the top. We have uh, poverty's grip on the UK must be broken. Uh, and we have uh, a good tweet here from Paul Lewis at the top um, saying that homelessness is set to grow as rising housing costs and insecure work continue to lock people into poverty, which is uh, very similar to the example I was just giving you. Here's another idea. Um, you can kind of think of it as a metaphor, but also as something literally to be about the design of the systems that we have. Um, and it's another idea that's been shown to work uh, to counter fatalism uh, and to show that change is possible because people can think that the economy or poverty are just too big to be able to fix or to change. Um, so this is useful because um, it shows that the economy or whatever system we want to talk about isn't something that just happens. It's being created by a set of decisions made by people and therefore different decisions made by people um, can change those systems. I'll just read out this, uh, this expression of redesign and then I have another example of this in just a moment for you. Um, the systems we have today were designed. They are the result of a set of decisions that were made about our society's priorities and resources. You can see a cheeky little bit of uh, values in there as well, our society's priorities and resources. Um, just as they were designed, we can redesign them so that they work for everyone. So yeah, this uh, 
This just spells that out, that people think that things are just the way they are. Nothing can really change them. And um, instead, we want to show them that systems don't, don't just do their own thing. They are the result of a set of decisions and they can and should be made to meet people's needs. And again, we have a doodle here, um, just sort of visualizing that um, the economy we have today was designed and it can be redesigned to work for everyone. Uh, so we've uh, we've got a little kind of toy town economy here where people are able to pick up the pieces and, and move them around as if they're redesigning it. And finally, for me, um, obviously need to mention Marcus Rashford again in case we uh, haven't given him enough of the limelight in the last couple of days, but he has been doing a great job. Uh, and this is a really good way of expressing the design and redesign idea. Um, I think we did look at this briefly yesterday, but um, now that I've explained the redesign idea, hopefully um, you'll be able to see how that's working here. So if the system is built by people, then we can rebuild it for everyone. It shows there's a solution. We're not just stuck with it. And it helps us get around that idea we talked about yesterday of economic naturalism, which is the idea that the economy is driven by forces outside of our control. So Marcus Rashford here, he hasn't said redesign explicitly, but um, as I said, you can. Um, there's a bit of flexibility in how you express uh, the metaphors and the values um, that Camille was talking about, as long as you're getting across that same concept, that same idea. So um, he said built here. The system isn't built for families like mine to succeed. And that helps to show that this isn't down to individuals. Um, it isn't down to people not trying hard enough. There is a system that is holding people back, um, restricting and restraining them. So um, anyway, talking of building, uh, uh, a tenuous pun and link here. I'll be handing over to Luke after the break uh, for more about how to construct a compelling story about poverty. Um, but we do have a quick refreshment break now, uh, just five minutes. So if you could come back, please, at 20 past 11, um, we will carry on then. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I hope that was long enough to get a quick cup of tea. So um, we've just learned to use values to establish a shared moral grounds for action and to avoid, uh, of course, we're avoiding those stories that will activate the harmful mental shortcuts or the unhelpful um, ideas. And we've been primed by Paul on the potential and the power of these tested metaphors um, just now from Paul. So in this session, um, we're briefly going to touch on the importance of sequence and how best to kind of order our thinking. And then we're going to look at context framing, looking at the power of explanation. That's a really important part of framing. So I'll get stuck into that. So sequence matters. We, we can start our conversation as, as Neil cued, and then you heard from Paul, um, sorry, from Camille, around um, using those tested values of compassion and justice to kind of Set the, set the terms of the conversation before we start and to really remind people how they care, which you heard from uh, Caroline, Caroline as well. People do care, but they need to sometimes that little bit of a nudge to remind them why they do that. And those, those values are really powerful at that. We then, once we've kind of set the scene and kind of um, lay, laid the territory, if you like, using those values, we can dive into the issue frame, uh, any given subject that we're talking about in, 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 in our uh, poverty conversation. Um, and we're going to explain rather than simply assert or tell people about poverty. And to do that, we really need to kind of unpack things. We need to show the events that pull people into poverty and to kind of illustrate how poverty uh, can happen for people. Uh, so we need to kind of frame the context and the circumstances, use the, use the metaphors to show how people find themselves caught in poverty. And doing so really cuts through, helps to cut through some of those base assumptions, some of those help, unhelpful uh, cultural models um, that people hold. So 
Exp explanation's powerful. We're going to do more on that in a second. Um, and But last but absolutely not least, we need to then, once we've kind of expanded the territory in terms of the, the experience, we need to um, cue those uh, solutions, those kind of efficacious um, ideas. Uh, and if in doubt, we, we want to kind of uh, add more solutions. Um, and if, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we're in any doubt, just add more. Um, we want those solutions. So when we're talking about the solutions to poverty, um, we need to remember those really dominant, unhelpful ways of thinking um, around fatalism, around political fatalism and economic fatalism. Um, so in terms of our solutions, as well as wanting lots of them, we want them to be um, sticky, active um, and tangible and kind of doable. So easy then, I think that's like a, a I've thrown down the gauntlet um, in this session as well, in terms of the how we want to mainstream uh, solutions and kind of bake them in throughout our work, but um, doing so only once we've really expanded the understanding of the experience of poverty, because without that expansion, uh, people don't understand the need for the kinds of solutions, the breadth of solutions that we want to see. So, tiny recap, because we're, we're getting towards the end of our conference, and this is, in a way, the most important priming of um, the lay of the land, the way the public think and feel around the poverty experience. Public have some ways which um, makes it harder for people to understand the causes and the solutions to poverty. Once they're activated, it's very difficult for them to, to walk back. Everybody can be successful if they try hard enough. Self-makingness, poverty is not happening anymore. Rants about poverty are just politically motivated. And we heard, um, I think it was Neil talking about the need to slightly depoliticize our um, our uh, our work to a certain extent, which sounds counterintuitive. But a lot of what we do when we make it too political is dismissible as politics. So we need to be aware of that one. Um, our, economy, our economy is shaped by powerful forces beyond our control and that fatalistic idea that the system's rigged. So we want to be careful of triggering that sense of elitism. Some stories, there's a reason I'm reiterating these and I'm going to build on the last one, okay? So some stories make it easier. Money gives us options and freedom. People in poverty have fewer resources and opportunities and that you can get caught there. Uh, but the government should take it, should take, is there for a reason, and the state should take care of our needs when we, when we need help, when we need support. Um, there's one other really big one, which I'd like to zoom in on a bit. So the research revealed that people's personal concepts of poverty, because of what they see, is its direst uh, forms in a way. So the term um, the term poverty makes pe the, the, the concept of poverty or the, the word poverty makes people think of non-negotiable needs. And we've, we, we did touch on that, but I'm just going to expand it a little bit. This one is a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, people think in terms of the basics only, food and shelter. Indeed, when we're sort of saying poverty, people may be actually thinking in their head destitution. So um, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, that understanding of the, the depth of poverty does lead people to understand, to cue people to kind of realize the need for, 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 for response, for change and for, for government action, excuse me. But on the other hand, just by focusing on the basic needs of food and shelter, that can be quite limiting and lead all other resources to be seen as kind of optional or desirable because once people have had their housing and their, uh, their, their kind of nutrition met, then um, aren't they fine? So this kind of limited understanding or this point of entry into um, the, 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 the experience of poverty also because it's, limited limits people's comprehension for the broad range of solutions that we need to see. 
Um, so it's a really important thing to know. This there's just something to bear bear in mind in, in your work. And I suppose that 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 thought of um, non-negotiable need, the direst forms of poverty, it might be because people um, are more likely to witness homelessness. There's been very dominant narrative around and coverage of food banks. Uh, and that's why people across society are not necessarily exposed to the breadth of uh, poverty. So this is a bit of a, this is a small thing actually, this is just a bit of a throwaway tip, but something I've learned recently, when, we, um, when, we're, when we're trying to use this uh, concept, rather than saying the words basic needs, talk about everyday needs, because everyday needs speaks of what we should all be able to have as a matter of course. And so, and, and so it's kind of, norming and it's a, a bit less triggering of that concept of non-negotiable needs that those bare essentials so next um we're going to look at a couple of passages and um i'll i'll read this one out and i just want to now that i've kind of recapped the the cultural models the ways of thinking the the mental shortcuts I would like to, I'd love um, for you to kind of put in the um, chat what you think, what models you think are being triggered by this, um, this passage. So I was living, this is Tracy, I was living in the same house for 14 years and then the landlord said he's selling it. But with the help of the law centre, we fought it for a while, but we got the eviction. It was horrible to think, now what, what am I going to do? So I went to the council and I ended up in a hotel and then a hostel, and that's where I met crisis. I started getting my confidence back and going on every course I could. Maths, IT, drama. I go to college as well. I want to work in some sort of support role. So I've been doing some uh, mentoring um, on drug and alcohol awareness courses. So I should say this is not, we're, this is, we're just using this as um, an example of um, uh, a pe it, it's not a criticism of uh, crisis. It's a, if, if this if this communication is from crisis, I'm not sure. Uh, we're just using an example. So, what what kind of um, mental what kind of uh, mental shortcuts do you think is it's triggering? And any other comments around this prose? Bearing in mind what we've learned about values and um, other aspects of framing. Yeah, individualizes the issue. Manon is saying uses. I rather than we. Any other thoughts or kind of quick analysis of this piece, this example? Self-makingness, absolutely. So it's really cueing two, two kind of thoughts which are unhelpful. One is that Tracy herself is inadvertently um, cueing the notion that it's on her um, and, and it's a, it's very the focus is very much on her as an individual what she's doing and what she should be feels she should be doing um, and um, if you can yeah if you try hard enough you, of course is you can escape so the emphasis that it's it's leaving the reader with that notion of self-makingness and also there's there's I would I would argue there's some um, some blame really really cued in there which is not is not helpful to Tracy or to anyone else in Tracy's situation. So um, self-making less and blame and possibly even the culture of poverty, some of those kind of tropes around um, drugs and alcohol, I don't think is helpful. So to kind of improve this passage, what would we need to do? What would we want to do? Um, I think we need to show the context in which Tracy has found herself. Um, for instance, how she came to be living, uh, how, how she's getting by, but also how she how she came to be living on a low income. What's happened to her? Has she um, is she getting by, for instance, on low paid work? Does her work not pay her enough? What about the systems, the services around her, like the social security payments? Are they adequate or any support services that she's um, um, accessing sufficient? And the state supports that should be in place. There's no indication 
um, of the expectation of what should be provided for all of us in that situation. So that kind of systemic context really leads people to support the systemic solutions, as I sort of cued earlier. So when people better understand what's going on, they're much more likely to have a broader uh, kind of openness towards the range of solutions that we're all talking about in our work. And this might seem totally straightforward, by the way, but it isn't always reflected in the way that we communicate as uh, change makers. Uh, so it's a really important one to kind of bear in mind. And um, the, th the thing about explanation is, isn't just kind of um, uh, what we've experienced in, in our work, which we certainly have, but that it's underpinned by the frameworks uh, research, which found that effective explanation uh, can actually double public support for an evidence-based solution um, compared to a straightforward description. So, it's, so explanation, I sort of see it as like a really big wrench on public understanding where we can kind of really open things up and we need to remember to do that. We need to remember to widen the lens, if you like, to reveal the systems at work. And this is what this is this is this is the thinking that underpins context framing. But sometimes the way I describe this um, as in my role is whenever we, whenever we kind of zoom in on one individual experience, uh, which is hugely worthwhile and hugely powerful as 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 Caroline tested and is, is a key part of our uh, work as a sector. But whenever we zoom into someone's experience, one individual's experience, we zoom out fast to really explain um, the context that that person is in, uh, putting a bit less emphasis on what they're doing about it, but a bit more emphasis on what happened that, that enabled them, that, how they got there in a way. And also um, zooming out as, as Caroline alluded to in her uh, contribution this morning, uh, the sense that um, I'm one of many, which I'm going to touch on in a second. So context framing then, it means telling those individual stories through a broader lens, but we can locate blame, we can still find the problems, we're still getting to the heart of the causes of poverty, um, but we're locating the problems, the blame, if you like, uh, in, in the systems or the structures around somebody rather than in, um, in, in the individual, rather than focusing on their individual choice or action. Really important question of emphasis. And doing so, actually zooming out from one person's experience to uh, the experience of many, really prevent stories that one one case from being dismissed as well that's just a problem for so and so i think caroline uh, was touching on that that um powerful effect as well um and and also doing so really explains why we need to uh, address uh those systemic uh conditions and fix the fix the systems if you like so coming back to zoe if you remember young Zoe, who's going to be president, as well as a really great um, example of values framing, Zoe for president is also a great example of strong context framing because um, she's an individual story, but she's kind of cued as an example, isn't she? Because Zoe, Zoe kind of could be any baby, um, but she, she, um, the video names all of the context and the kind of system support that Zoe will need to thrive. So it touches on early learning, childcare, mentorship, after school care. And that's just really powerful. I mean, look how short that video was. It was a really short clip, but um, really well framed. So it's a reminder that explanation, when we're talking about explanation, doesn't always have to be really long, quite often, 
things are a bit longer um, when we're framing stuff. I think Paul would probably agree with that as a copywriter. Sometimes we do need to unpack things um, more than we have historically, but we can also do so in really creative, pithy ways just to with, with that question of emphasis. And it takes skill. And I think the way that Camille was inviting people to be creative, framing is a creative platform, um, comes back to those important editorial choices that we can make. So one more example then. Um, I'm gonna read this one out, okay. As, so, so Vicky, is a single parent who works 16 hours a week as a lunch lady at a local school. She has a 10 year old son. She describes how she rotates the household bills she can't pay in order to ensure that she does not fall into severe debt with any one organization. She's realized that her council tax and water bills are ones where there's usually a bit more flexibility with her payment date. So in a month where she can't afford all the outgoings, she says she'll cancel her direct debit to the council and wait until she's chased for payment before paying it. She says as long as she pays up before it gets to the point of receiving a court summons or risking bankruptcy, she can manage her finances like that in this way. Any, what's, what's this, Kim? What do we think of this passage, folks? Any kind of mental shortcuts or things that um, come to mind when you're looking at this? What about it as an example of someone's context framing? Any thoughts? Well, let me give you the answer. I don't have a, a snazzy poll to take the, the, the opinion uh, uh, from the group. Um, it's, it's good, but it's, it could do better. And how, how unique is Vicky? You know, do we get a sense that she's just, one experience um, or is is she dismissible as, as one individual case? What about the system here? Maybe the system here is working because Vicky's got flexibility. She's actually kind of able to work around the system and she is making choices and there's emphasis on what she's doing to manage her money. And potentially the reader's solution is like, well, she needs to manage her money better. And if possibly even she might be kind of cooking the system because it's talking about how she kind of works around the, 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 the needs of the, the, the system around her. So there's nothing here on, um, on, on, on what should be different in, in order that Vicky has a, a better chance. What are the options and opportunities that Vicky needs to move forward and to get ahead? There's nothing here on more adequate pay. There's nothing here on childcare and the pressures of her having a 10 year old child. So this is another one where we could do better. Um, so the next, so, so the next time, the next slide, sorry, I'm just gonna talk through some, cause I think these are really helpful. I've given you some examples of where it could be done better. These these snippets really give a few phrases that were put together with Frameworks's lived experience group. And um, I'm just going to look at the, the, the ones at the top. So like a lot of working parents, people with health problems, I, this affects, this affected more than just me. So many people are affected by this. It's a widespread problem. This is about collectivizing. And then the next examples is using that restriction and restraint cut down on my options, minimize my opportunities, restricted my options. So it's a sense of people getting stuck. And um, another, the next line is actually quite important. So talking about the support that you do get and the fact that some people get support, some people don't get the support. That's a, that's a way of um, queuing, well, what should, what, what should, in our society, what support should people uh, get? And the benefits system, it should have been there to um, provide for me or to be a lifeline for my family. And the support system should be there for everyone who needs it, for all of us. So powerful, uh, powerful stuff in terms of ad adding these snippets to our, um, to our storytelling. 
and um, yeah, it's kind of notice how when we're using these terms, poverty unmistakably becomes an experience of circumstance with quite unjust effects. And there's no possibility of poverty being written off as a condition or a way that certain people are. So that's also why that context is powerfully undercutting um, some of those uh, unhelpful ways of thinking. So just to kind of recap some top tips, we're gonna locate the blame in systems, not in individual choices. We're not gonna use the word choices at all, but we're gonna talk about options because the word options cues um, uh, circumstance, whereas the word choices, even though they might seem similar, um, cues individual uh, responsibility or self-makingness. And we're gonna name the systems of support that either improve or reduce uh, somebody's options. And we're gonna use extended explanatory metaphor. One key thing to watch out for, right? When we're, because we're focusing on systems and we're focusing on um, system services, watch out for accidentally cueing negative thinking around systems and services. Watch out for that, that idea of the system's broken or the system's rigged. And that's why the metaphor is a powerful way of um, kind of avoiding that. But we, we in, in, in our framing, um, systems are solutions. We, we remember the redesign metaphor that Paul talked about, the need for positive solutions. So we're going to explain how negative events can sweep people into poverty and how poverty's effects can hold people back. And we are going to illustrate a much more diverse range and breadth of experiences of poverty. And we're gonna, in doing so, we're gonna remember that our audience's starting point is so often that concept of NNN, non-negotiable needs. We're gonna zoom out from one person's experience, just as Caroline was talking about, to collectivize the issue. We're gonna locate the problems in the systems and services, not in the people but we are positioning the changes we need to see as positive solutions to avoid that fatalistic thinking. And if in doubt, we can add more solutions, 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 solutions. So I'm going to conclude that piece on um, explanatory framing for understanding. I hope that's been helpful. Um, and I think we're now going to move into a bit of a Q and A with the rest of the panel, I think, with the other uh, presenters. Yes, uh, it's it's back to me to bring this morning's session to a close with a quick ten minutes of Q and A, and then just some reflections from me. Can I ask the audience if they would put in um, <coughs> a, a type their responses in the Q and A box, please, rather than the chat box? Um, and while you're doing that, I'm going to use my chair's privilege to ask the panel, um, what would you say to all those charity fundraisers and um, you know, top tips that tell us that what we really need is good individual stories? Um, I mean, you, you, perhaps it was unfortunate for crisis, but I mean, you know, we are all told ad, in, ad nauseam, really, that, that what, you know, we have to find somebody. Um, and if we can't find somebody, we, we use a, a, you know, a made up example, making clear it is made up. What, what, what would your response be, uh, Luke? Thanks, Victoria. So unmistakably, in our, in our movement, the, the, the voices of people with experience are a powerful um, force for change. And there hasn't been um, a social movement in history that hasn't been led by the people who are experiencing um, that reality. So um, yes, people's voices uh, authentically are, are critical to, to, this, to this movement. And I think the work that Camille leads as part of JRF um, is testament to that, but that we kind of need to move beyond um, 
uh, the concept of illustration so that actually people can participate on a much deeper level to shape the narrative, to kind of shape and structure the conversation and um, kind of mainstream the solutions that we're wanting to see. So, so yes, all, all, all organizations in our sector, such as fundraising organizations especially, they, they do need to work with partners who are experiencing the issue, um, but it's about how that work's done and it's about, um, yeah, it's about it being more um, led and co-designed and co-curated by the people who are experiencing rather than this slightly um, old fashioned view of, we need this case study to illustrate this point. Um, I don't know whether, I wonder whether, Camille, you might want to come in on that one. Right, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm hoping that I can share screen. We're going a little bit off off piste here. Um, oh, maybe you can't see. Can you see? Yeah. Can you see a uh, spectrum of participation? Or can yeah. you see my desktop? Great. Okay. Um, so um, this isn't about framing, but I think it's really important that we talk about it. So um, this is the spectrum, spectrum of participation that we use at JRF to guide our own work. Um, and I'm happy to have conversations with people about this after this webinar because it's not really the focus of this but just to pick up on a few things that um, Luke was saying is um, you know individual stories are important and through our tra tap training our talking about poverty training it's it's um, one of the more developed areas of our um, of our work with people with direct experience is to train them in a more intense intensive way um, than um, than just a, a webinar, for example, on how to use, you know, all of those elements of framing to ensure that they're doing that, um, that they're able to share their story in a way that is non-stigmatizing and empowering and safe. Um, but for us at JRF, um, it's all about working with groups of people who have got that support rather than um, going out reactively looking for case studies, which we would say is at a level one um, level of our participation spectrum and to be avoided really at, at all costs. The work that we do in co-designing our policy solutions really occurs at this level three level with people with direct um, experience. So they can identify what the problem is in their community, but also they're probably likely to know what would fix that problem and so through working with them um, in a co-design way through um, we develop those solutions with them and then they go on then uh, to become spokespeople on those solutions and um, on that issue so we've taken them on a journey um, with us rather than again going out to them reactively in a um, in a I suppose an unsafe way but um, I'll stop sharing now but I just thought if anyone wants to have a chat about that we've also got a good blog on on this spectrum so I'm, um, I'm happy to share that after as well. well. That's great thanks very much Camille. There's a question here from Paula and Paula says that a significant perceived barrier to solutions is the cost of implementation. Um, we've got this as a very live issue in Wales at the moment um, in, in respect of free school meals um, she's asking, how can you, how can we present arguments about cost in a, in, based on the, the framing lessons that uh, you've shared with us today? Is that something, Paul, you could answer? I can have a go. Um, I think, I mean, the, the, the Lifeline campaign that I've talked about a couple of times is probably a good example of where we've done this. Um, obviously, there is a big cost to keeping that uplift of £20 a week in universal credit. Um, but where we succeeded in getting the extension on that was that um, there was a kind of a movement, a kind of um, an outcry, I suppose, from the public and a growing number of politicians as well, um, seeing that it wouldn't be right to leave, um, sort of leave people short of that £20 a week. So it's where we can really use those values quite strongly to make the case and kind of build that kind of collective understanding and the um, like the pressure on people in, in the positions to make change happen um, so that they um, 
they find it hard to ignore, really. Uh, and to do the opposite of what people are calling for would then make them look bad. So um, it's not exactly shaming them into doing something, but it is about showing how we all have these, um, these shared values and to kind of do the opposite is to kind of do the opposite of those values as well. I hope that made sense. That does. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left uh, and I don't think we have any more questions coming through. Um, someone's asked if we can have a copy of the presentations, which I think that's possible. And also a reminder that the webinar, the two sessions have both been recorded. Before I just wind up, um, we have, of course, had these two sessions in the medium of English. But many of us in Wales also not only speak Welsh, but operate in Welsh. And we have had discussions with the JRF team about making materials available in both languages here. And I'd like to just invite my colleague, Stefan Evans, uh, to just say a few words um, in English or Welsh, as you wished, about the availability of materials. Yeah, Victoria. Uh, um, um, I, I, I just uh, quickly mention in, in English so that you can share with people in your organisations as well. But um, after this session, there will be an email going round um, with, with a pack that will, um, will hopefully be really useful in terms of giving you some advice in terms of how to do this in practice. And we're very grateful for Joe F who have managed to translate that into Welsh as well. Um, so obviously some of the, te uh, the testing has been done in English because that's obviously been done at a GB um, level, but you know, kind of like, I've, I've had a look through it and it works very well in Welsh as well. Um, so, um, so that should hopefully be really useful in particular for people who are engaging kind of with Welsh media or kind of um, stakeholders in Welsh. And if anyone wants a further discussion about that, um, then I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with people around that because, you know, this is something that we're definitely learning as well, isn't it, Victoria? I don't think we can claim to be experts in this in any shape or form, but I think it's a really quite interesting space for us, maybe something that probably hasn't been thought of about doing in Welsh before. Dear Stefan, I mean, I, 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 I've, my reflections on the last two days have been that we have heard and learnt some really, really powerful tools. I'm um, hearing how it's been effective with activists, as we heard from Scotland this morning, hearing the case studies has really, I think, il illustrated to all of us that there is value. Um, and in fact, it's an imperative to change what we do. This isn't about um, the ni niceness of, of how we present, um, you know, diff different kinds of information. If we believe in solving poverty, then we really have to take notice of these very important findings. And I think if we all begin to do it, we can begin to amplify our messages. We're all using the same language. We're, we're, we, we, we may not always agree with each other, but we are be beginning to build a common set, a common approach and a common narrative around poverty. I think the lesson that I've learned from, this, from yesterday and today is that, um, it's not just about changing language. I think it's very easy to look at a thesaurus and think, oh yes, I've got to talk about currents and I've got to stop talking about in poverty and say trapped in poverty. But actually it's about something much deeper than that. And it means that we have to step back, or certainly I have to step back and think about what are the values we want to trigger, what are the metaphors we want to, want to use and, and how can we, avoid some of the pitfalls that you very helpfully demonstrated. So there's, there's a great deal there for us to, 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 to take away. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things of follow up because I, I don't really, it, it feels like we, don't, we can't just leave, away, leave this and, and walk away. Um, Camille is organizing uh, some talking about poverty workshops, particularly for people with lived experience of poverty. And if you would like to get in touch Hopefully you'll be able to do that through the follow-up email. But I'm also wondering if there's something that we in Wales could do to take forward some of this, um, to, to share and pool our experiences and our tips. Um, and perhaps that's something for a, uh, a separate discussion, but I, I do think it's very powerful. I just want to finish off with taking my hat off to two things that 
um, I'm certainly going to be taking away from this. The first one was to Helen Barnard for having the presence of mind to pivot the conversation with Julia Hartley Brewer. I just thought that was amazing. How many of us would have either gone on the back foot and have just been completely destroyed or, or started arguing. And I think having the presence of mind to be able to change that narrative deserves a medal. And the second thing is Zoe for president. Absolutely, yes. That was a brilliant example and she's a brilliant future president. So can I thank the JRF team for a really superb two days. Thank everyone who's participated in the two days for sticking with us. And I, I had some challenging and interesting questions. And I hope we can all go forward together to help to solve poverty in Wales. Thanks very much. <laughs>